take up the last case, which is Mann versus Unum Life Insurance Company of America. Yes, sir. Please proceed. to save any time for rebuttal? Five minutes, please. All right. Good morning. My name is Brian Warwick from the law firm of Varnell and Warwick in the Villages, Florida. I say I'm from the Villages because that's the largest senior population uh, concentrated in one particular area in the state of Florida. And I'm here on behalf of the seniors that are my clients in this case. And it's an important case because it involves nursing home insurance. And what's important to point out at the beginning of this case is that Medicare does not cover nursing home costs. It's important to note because neither do most health care policies unless there's a specific injury related to the nursing home care. But the care for simply getting older to the point where you can't take care of yourself and needing a nursing home is not going to be covered by Medicare. So what happens in a lot of situations, if you do not have nursing home coverage, what happens is the family winds up paying out of their pocket until they become destitute. They, they sell their home, they go through the cash that they have until it's gone, and then they qualify for Medicaid in the state of Florida, and the Florida taxpayers thereafter pick up the tab for their nursing home care. So your clients bought a long-term health care policy. That's right. They try to do the right thing. They try well, this, to. Uh, let, me, let me just ask this question so I can limit the issues. This really isn't a, dis, a, co a coverage dispute. Well, it, effectively, it is a coverage dispute well, in, in that what happens is if you, increase, if you increase premiums to the point where people can't afford to pay them, then you're terminating their coverage. Then you get another carrier. People well, do it all the time. You can't qualify then because you're 78 instead of 65. And this is not a termination of coverage. Correct. Case. There is no termination here. It was an increase of premiums. So it's an increase of premiums of a policy that was executed and delivered in Connecticut, correct? Correct, and then renewed thereafter. And so okay. there are two points in the contract that I think govern and, and don't require us to go any further. Well, I, I need to ask you something Certainly. about your, the relief that you're requesting because in the brief you are asking us to completely reverse the trial court and to apply Florida law. That's correct. And that would be a decision on the merits. Well, are you asking us to decide this case on the merits, or are you asking us to decide whether the trial court was correct in deciding the merits of the motion to dismiss? I believe that the specific issue of whether the contract language interpreted is an issue of the merits, and because it's a succinct issue, that can be decided on the merits. But I do believe that deciding it at the motion to dismiss stage and the way the trial court did was error. So to the extent this court wishes to address the merits of that issue and interpret the language of the contract, I would ask it to do so and to do so in our favor. But to the extent the court wants to look at whether it was proper for the trial court to address the merits on a motion to dismiss in the manner in which it did, uh, I think that is also an issue of error that we've raised. Well, statutory construction could be an issue for a declaratory action, could it not? Absolutely. And is, that not, is that not what happened here? That's what I did. I tried to get a specific declaration. And at the motion to dismiss stage, before we could do any more discovery, do anything else to get into the merits of our arguments and brief it as, as a summary judgment type motion, it was decided by the trial court, you know, summarily. And so technically she did rule on the merits at the motion to dismiss stage. But, you know, the standard there, which should have been with the evidence viewed in light most favorable to the non-moving party, which was us, but because it was an issue of law, I believe the court just addressed it outright without viewing the evidence in light most favorable to us or our interpretations as set forth in the complaint. But did the court have enough to review the merits? We have a Florida statute, the Connecticut statute, and we have a policy attached to the deck action. Well, and that's why I raised it as an issue of error that not only was an issue error of the deck action the way she ruled, but I also ruled that she ruled incorrectly. So I believe this court could interpret the language of the contract and the statutes accordingly. And there are two provisions of the contract that I think are, are dispositive of this issue. The first is the guaranteed renewability provision of the contract, which is at appendix number two, page one. And yes, this is a guaranteed renewable policy, and it states, you may renew this policy on each policy anniversary 
by paying each premium before its grace period ends. We reserve the right to change premiums to this policy. To do so, we must change the premiums for all similar policies issued in your state on this policy form. Any change in premium will be effective on your policy anniversary date. We will send you written notice at least 31 days in advance. So that's the first provision I think is illustrative and we need to look at here. Because when you combine, combine that provision with the conformity clause of the policy, which is on page 18 of the policy, the conformity clause was written by Unum so that it could increase the premiums because that's what it was really concerned about. They want to say this is the continuation of one single policy, but it's not how a continuation it, of a single policy. How could it not be policy. the continuation of one single policy when you refer to anniversary? Well, it also refers to renewal, and so the difference is this, but, but they changed nowhere, the premium. There's nowhere in this policy where it says the renewal is a new contract. But that's the policy of the state of Florida. That's not the policy language here. But the state Are you arguing that this uh, clause about guaranteed renewability, where to do so we must change the premiums for similar policies issued in your state, that that means Florida? Uh, when you read that section with the conformity clause, yes. If you read the conformity clause, this is what it says. If any provision of this policy conflicts with the statute of the state, where you reside on the effective date of that provision, Okay, so the residents... Well, you're arguing that a premium is a provision of the policy when the legal definition of a provision is a clause in a legal instrument. How can a premium be a provision of a policy? I think the premiums are a provision of every policy. In fact, it's the most how critical so? provision of a lot of the policies. How so? It's well, just how much the policy costs. It's not, how, not what coverage is provided. But the premium that you pay, when you have to pay it, if you don't pay it, what happens? All those issues involving premiums are certainly part of the contract. In fact, from the consumer standpoint, that's a critical part well, of the Well, let me ask you this question then. Because if the conformity clause contemplated premium being a provision of the policy, then isn't the second sentence absolutely unnecessary? Because the second sentence says premiums may be changed to reflect these policy requirements. If that meant premium as a provision, you wouldn't need the second sentence. I, I think that doesn't the second this, section is a clarification. Mean, doesn't this conformity statute mean that if a provision of this policy conflicts with the statutes of a state, which means like Bell Care, which was a Florida policy, but Florida law had changed with respect to coverage. Therefore, the policy had to change with that change in the law. So here we have a provision of the policy, if it conflicts with the statutes of the state where you reside on the effective date of provision, that if any part of this policy conflicts with state law right. concerning when? coverage. When? When do you have to look at that? You have to look at it but it's when the provision conflicts. But it's concerning conflicts. coverage. It's not concerning a premium because the second sentence is completely unnecessary if you're arguing that the provision of a policy is a premium. Why do you need the second sentence? Because the second section clarifies exactly what you're saying. It's basically saying, in case the court or somebody else wants to interpret it as not being a provision of this policy, we're going to clarify it. Look, this provision, premiums may be changed to reflect these policy requirements. Yeah, premiums so, will be changed if coverage changes. If we have to give you more coverage, the premium's going up. If we have to give you less, the premium will go down. That's what it says. We want to have the right to change the premiums. Right. And so if we do, in the future, so we're going to look to where you we're going to look to the statutes where you reside at the time of that conflict. So are you arguing this is unambiguous? No, I think it's very ambiguous. But that's that's part of the problem is that if you're trying to read it, and you say, okay, well, at the last sentence says that they're talking about premiums here. So okay, if you want to increase the premium, I mean, I'm reading it as the as the consumer, if they want to increase my premiums, what do they have to do? And so if you read up before it and you say, well, okay, they're going to look to the statute of the state where I live on the effective date of that change, and they're going to make sure they comply. <laughs> That's not what it says. It says if a provision of the policy conflicts with state law of another state. It doesn't say if the premium rate conflicts with another state's premium rate, that state premium rate will apply. I, I think that what, what the distinction here is, under the Long-Term Care Act, and because these are 
health insurance issues, the rates are regulated by statute, and maybe that's the distinction. And they're regulated by the Con they're, Connecticut Department of Insurance. As well as, as Florida. Well as Florida. And so both Florida and, and Connecticut agree, law. You would agree that Unum went through the Connecticut Department of Insurance before they even raised rates. Right. Which is a public policy argument. You may have an argument if they didn't go through the Connecticut Department of Insurance before they raised the rates on the mans, but they did, didn't they? But they were no longer connected to Connecticut at that time. But it's still going through a government agency for approval. This is not a unilateral act, correct? Correct. Okay. It's not a unilateral act, but the issue is which, which state's law has the biggest interest. In principles of comedy, you look to the two, law, two states and you say, well, who's more connected to this issue, the state of Florida or the state of Connecticut? Yeah, yes. You need stability in the law also. Well, that's what the Bell Care case said. I mean, they could, move and, around and under, to, they could move around to 15 different states. Is Unum, Unum going to be subject to every state they move to? Underneath their language of this provision that says, I, I'm going to determine where you reside on the effective date. They didn't have to say that. If you look in Bell Care, what the policy said there was on the effective date of the policy. Well, Bell Care, I don't or think Or where it was delivered. Bell Care is a Florida policy. But and there's no, the, choice okay. of, there's no choice of law discussion whatsoever. Everybody concedes it's a Florida policy. But, Plus, there's different language in that policy where it says a renewal is a new policy. Here we don't have that. It doesn't say a renewal is a new policy. In there. It says it, it's guaranteed in Bell Care. The, the Bell language Care, of Bell Care, renewal, it says, just it has language similar to this clause. It says a renewal of this policy on each anniversary date. So they, they talk about renewal. But here's the important thing. Under Florida law, the Landy case from this court, Landy versus Nationwide Insurance, says, observing that the policy at issue had been renewed after the enactment of certain statutory requirements, then the general rule in Florida is that upon each renewal, of an insurance policy, an entirely new and independent contract of insurance is created. So that's the law in Florida. Here's the law in Connecticut. A policy of insurance is the contract between the parties. A renewal of the original policy is a separate and distinct contract, providing coverage for a specific period of time. So both Connecticut and Florida say, if you renew it, it's a new contract. But what, so, law, what law says it's a, a Florida law applies? Well, then you, then you go to, to their this? argument of lex loci contractus and say, at the time of renewal, which state had the contacts? And so you look to it and you say, okay, this provision here says we're going to send you notice 31 days in advance. But that's not what the long-term care statute says in Florida. It applies only to policies issued or issued for delivery in this state, period. It, it, or renewed. It says issued or renewed. Well, the renewal applies to Florida policies. It wouldn't, that's the plain meaning of that language. This is, this is the crux that will have to go up to the, to the Supreme Court if this is, if this is the distinction. But, but what is at issue here is that they put language in here that says the place of residence is instructive. And it's instructive when the conflict with state law arises. And so if you look at where they live when the conflict arises, there was 10 years the premiums didn't change. And because they specifically referenced premiums, they were talking about premiums as a provision. So for those 10 years, there was no conflict. And if you have to forever go back to Connecticut law, they knew people were going to move. That's why they said, we're going to conform to the law where you live at the time of the conflict, because that makes sense. Why? Because this is where the health care is going to be provided. Sense. Doesn't, it, doesn't it make it impossible for them to estimate their exposures? It seems to me it makes no sense. Because what you could do is, it, let's presume for a moment that um, it's all about risk. That's what they're, that's the premiums based on risk. You could be in a state where risk is minimal and a premium set there, and then the insurers could pick up and go to a state in California, wherever, where maybe risk would be higher if they initially got the policy there. So they're doing an end run. Unum is trying to limit its risk and exposure by writing the policies in the state of Connecticut. I would agree with you, but for their ability to change the rates. Because not if they had locked in, not unilaterally, but if they had locked in the rate and simply said this, we will agree to a premium of X increased by 5% a year forever. And as long as we keep that agreement, our agreement is good. Because my clients' amounts don't change. They get $6,000 a month plus the stated rate of this policy. They can't go back and say, hey, health insurance costs have gone up, you know. We would like to increase our coverage as well. 
That's not what's allowed. But your client signed a policy whereby Unum reserved the right to change premiums for the pop. They agreed to that. I agree with you. But when they do make that change and they give you the 31-day notice, then that constitutes a new policy. And then under Lex Loci Contractus, you have to look at which state has the contacts then. And at that time, they were residents of Florida. They'd been in Florida for six years. They were not, had no intent to go back to Connecticut. Their long-term care insurance is going to be provided in the state of Florida. If they don't have coverage and can't afford these premiums, then guess what happens? They have to sell their home. They pay for their nursing home coverage until they go bankrupt. And then Medicare, Medicaid, from the state of Florida, pays these costs. You're, you're so the state of Florida has forward. an interest. You're, you're at 15 minutes, so you, you've got five minutes left. You can continue or save the time for rebuttal as you wish. The distinction here, I'll, I'll, I understand my time constraints, is that they wanted to change the premiums. If they had been locked into their premiums, we would have a constant and ongoing contract. But in Bell Care, the Third Circuit looked at it and said, you know what, that was guaranteed renewable as well. And they said, look, at the time we, we, we investigated and determined what our risk was, we didn't know the law was going to change in Florida. We shouldn't be bound by that change because we didn't apply for it in the risk. But the Third Circuit said, look, you guys could change the premiums, and that's the way it goes. That's a new policy, and therefore you're bound by the new statutes. The, the same thing should apply here. The determinative language in Bell Care was the claims portion of this policy in Bell Care clearly notified that premiums were due at the start of each policy term. And the court concluded that there was no clear vision of one continuous contract. This particular policy says each policy anniversary. That's totally different. And, and, and the third district made a distinction out of that. Well, I think that the, the term being that anniversary meaning a yearly term versus anniversary or term being less than a year, isn't that the difference? It's a year-long term the by you referring to the word anniversary? Are you asking me a question? I mean, I, I would make that argument that, yes, that's in fact what, what they meant. It was just a different use of the word term being anniversary being a yearly term. I'll reserve the rest of my time. Thank All right, you. sir. Good morning. Uh, Jason Corella with me with Raul Cuervo from Carlton Fields, Jordan Burt, on behalf of the Apelli Unum. Uh, there's a couple of issues here that I think I need to clarify. And the, the first is an understanding of the way that these insurance statutes work. Because uh, just a plain reading of the applicable provisions of the insurance code puts this entire case to rest. Um, and the let, applicable let, me, let me just ask you a yeah. housekeeping question before you, you get yeah. to that. Um, were, were these folks not entitled to get a declaratory judgment? I mean, is it appropriate to determine this case on a motion to dismiss? I mean, if they're asking to have their rights determined um, on a declaratory judgment, why, why can't they get that? Um, absolutely. Uh, excellent question. Unambiguous contracts and interpretation of clear provisions of statutory law uh, you're not entitled to uh, declaratory judgments about. To trigger the jurisdiction under the Declaratory Judgment Act, the moving party must show a doubt, a, an objective legitimate doubt as to the existence or non-existence of a right, such that they're entitled to have that doubt removed. Um, I can't ask this court for a declaration, for example, that I'm allowed to go on red lights and stop on green lights. Well, you just look right to the statutes and it explains that when there's a red light, you have to stop, and when there's a green light, you have to go. Did Mr. Mann allege that he had a doubt and a bona fide dispute as to whether Florida law applies? The question of whether it's bona fide or not is a legal question. It's not something that the court Is that something to be determined at a motion to dismiss? Absolutely. For the sufficiency? Because the case law is clear. A motion to dismiss is not a determination of the merits. It's a determination of the sufficiency. Right. It's basically to determine whether a plaintiff's entitled to a declaration of their rights, not whether they're entitled to a declaration in their favor. Right. And when there is no bona fide doubt, which is something that is a pleading standard and the court can determine that this doubt, this dispute they're making is not a bona fide one, then you can have it on dismissal. And we cite a number of cases in our brief, uh, Valencia versus Lake Homeowners Association, which is a third DCA case, 
2010, Junico v. State Board of Accountancy, which is a Florida Supreme Court case, 1980, Fladell v. Palm Beach County Canvassing Board, which is a Florida Supreme Court case, 2000. I could go on, this is in our brief at page 37 and also on note 7 and page 10 and 11. These are all cases where courts uh, decide on the merits uh, at the dismissal stage of declaratory judgment action. And it's in situations where this, where the court's merely asking to interpret an unambiguous contract term or to, ter to interpret an unambiguous statute. If we were to go back uh, to the trial court, just for the trial court to enter a judgment on the pleadings based on a plain interpretation of law, that wouldn't be serving anybody's interest, not, not the plaintiffs, not defendants, and not the court, because we'd just be back here in six months on the same same issues. Well, the court didn't take any evidence at all, just made a determination on the merits. Uh, there was no evidence needed. The statutes are something over which the court takes well, judicial notice. Well, she construed statutes. That's, isn't that going beyond the four corners of the complaint and what's attached there to? The statute's not attached there to. The statutes are She the had law. to do something in addition to assessing the sufficiency of the complaint and the attachments there to. She did statutory construction. Isn't that something that's more uh, suited for a summary judgment proceeding? Uh, no. Why the, not? Well, first of all, this case can be resolved also by a plain um, interpretation of the contract language, which is attached to the complaint. It can also be resolved based on the allegations in the complaint. For example, that the policy was issued on December 3rd, 1998, when they resided in Connecticut. It can also be resolved based on a plain applicability of the law to the facts of the case. What a court does on a motion to dismiss is they look at the allegations of the complaint, including the documents that are attached to the complaint, and they decide as a matter of law whether that states a claim or not. And you can look at these and look at the applicable law and determine that it does not state a claim. And there's nothing that plaintiffs can do to fix the facts here. What they brought is a case where they're seeking to apply Florida law to a Connecticut-issued policy where the statutes, in effect, say that when a policy is issued for delivery and delivered in a state, in this case, Connecticut, it's subject to Connecticut law and subject to Connecticut oversight. This is a guaranteed renew renewable insurance policy. It is the same policy form that's issued to hundreds of residents of Connecticut. And, those, and the policy terms are governed by Connecticut law. And every policyholder in that policy group has to be treated the same. What makes a guaranteed renewable policy nice is it provides a peace of mind to the policyholder. The, the, the insurance company cannot change the law applicable to the policy. They can't amend the provisions just with respect to Mr. and Mrs. Mann. And they can't raise the insurance rates just with respect to Mr. and Mrs. Mann. The policy terms are locked in and the rate is locked in. The only way to change the rate is to apply to the appropriate regulatory agency for um, a rate change increase. And it's not saying, hey, the Manns are having a bad year. It's saying, this is our experience. Actuaries put forth you know, uh, a memorandum explaining that this is how we thought the loss experience on this policy was going to be. But it turns out that it was more extreme than we thought. In order for this policy to remain viable, for there to be premiums to pay claims for people like the Manns when they need the care, we need to raise the rate. And that's, a, and that's the exact same under Connecticut law for Connecticut-issued policies and, and under Florida law for Florida-issued policies. How does the language of the conformity with state statutes clause negate man's deck action? Um, it specifically says that uh, we're dealing here with the statutes of the state where you reside on the effective date of that provision. Of that provision. Capital E, capital D. If you look at page four of the contract, it uh, indicates where there are defined terms and says uh, specifically that many of the terms in this policy have special meanings. A list of these terms and their meanings follows. Then you go down to page five, it says effective date, again, capital E, capital D, is the date shown on the policy schedule and coverage takes effect on that effective date, provided a premium. But counsel's arguing that provision includes premium. Do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. But um, a change in premiums is something that's expressly contemplated in the policy right on page one that says that we're going to, uh, there, Florida law does not um, apply to this policy simply because there's an amendment to the policy or simply because there's a unilateral extension to the policy. Um, the policy specifically contemplates that it continues in force as long as the policyholder pays 
premiums timely and otherwise complies with the policy terms. And it contemplates under appropriate circumstances that the rate may increase. But it has to increase as to everybody in the rating group, which are Connecticut issued insurance in this case. And as a matter of Connecticut statutes and the insurance code, you have to apply to the Connecticut Insurance Department to get approval for that rate change increase. So um, that's something that's specifically contemplated by this contract. This is Contracts 101. Back in 1998, the MANS said, I'd like to be covered by a policy with terms like this. And Unum said, we're willing to offer you insurance coverage under those terms at this rate. Now, that rate may change, but we're going to give you notice, and here's how that rate may change. The parties had a meeting of the minds, and they entered into a contract. And they've been continuing in that contract ever since 1998. There's been, uh, you know, the only changes in the contract, uh, and it's not up to a term of the contract, but, but the price for renewal of the contract is set forth in the, in the uh, approved rate change, which is expressly contemplated on day one of the contract. This differs from uh, the other cases that uh, appellants cite related to one-year term insurance contracts, like automobile insurance contracts and homeowners insurance contracts. That's a contract where the insurance company says, I'll cover you for a year. And you say, OK, I'll accept coverage for a year at this price. When that year ends, the insurance company can decide to drop you. They can decide, hey, I'm going to continue covering you, but the terms are going to change or the rates are going to change. And there has to be a new meeting of the minds at every contract renewal period. And that makes this case fundamentally different from the kinds of term insurance cases uh, that we're dealing with there. And the reason for the difference, the reason for the guaranteed renewable is not for Unum's benefit. It's to protect the insurers. They're buying these policies when they're young and healthy. And they want to be able to have the coverage for when they get sick and they need care. And so it would not serve them if at the end of a year when they finally get into a nursing home or something, the company could say, you know what, I don't think you're a good risk anymore. I know you've been paying premiums for 20 years, but, you know, sorry, you're going to have to pay twice as much in premium now or we're not going to cover you. This policy prevents that from happening. They pay their premiums and the policy remains in force. It's the same policy that they entered into into 1998, and it continues through now. Another argument that... Um, the appellants make is, well, when they move to Florida, that's like it's just a whole new contract. And that's not true. Now, the plaintiff had the option when they moved into Florida to say, hey, I don't want to be covered by this Connecticut insurance policy anymore. I have a unilateral right to cancel it, or I have a unilateral right not to renew it. They were free to do that. And then they could have applied to Unum or anybody else to get a Florida-issued policy subject to Florida law. The difference in that policy and this policy would be that policy would indicate that it's a Florida-issued policy subject to Florida law, which is a requirement for policies that are issued in Florida. It would have a different set of provisions in this policy uh, to accord with Florida law, and it would be filed with and approved by the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation as being a long-term care insurance policy complying with the provisions of Florida law. It would also be different because Mr. and, Mr. Man, Mr. and Mrs. Mann would be um, charged for that policy based on representations that they would make in a new application and based on their health and age at the time in 2005 when they would be applying for this new policy and not based on their health and age in 1998 when they applied for their Connecticut policy. They were the only ones that had the right to change this policy and they uh, decided that they were happy with the Connecticut policy and they're subject to Connecticut law and the, the oversight of the Connecticut Insurance Department. What's your response to the argument that Connecticut law um, deems a renewal a new contract? Um, Connecticut law does not. And the case that he cites is in, in the context of a guaranteed renewable policy. The cases that he cites deal with term uh, insurance policies like an automobile policy. And that's true because there's a meeting of the minds at every policy term where the insured can change the rates, they can change the policy terms, and both the insured and the insurer have a right to get out of the policy. So under Connecticut law, your argument is, under Connecticut law, a long-term care policy is a continuous policy. That's correct. Is there a case that you've cited in, the, in your brief that supports that legal um, position? Guaranteed renewable policies are um, a, a very narrow and special kind of policy. So a lot of the cases that deal with these issues are cases that deal with term insurance policies like Guillen that they cite, like some of the Connecticut cases that they cite. It's a different set of circumstances. But that point um, occurred to me uh, last night as I was preparing, and I wildly searched through Westlaw to see, um, you know, 
whether this situation has come up before. And uh, couch on insurance, for example, uh, this is two couch on insurance 2935, says where a policy of insurance is in a sense automatically renewed when the insured pays an additional premium, the parties are deemed by the original contract of insurance. There's a Florida Supreme Court case at the life insurance, which is at 266 US 389, that holds that a policy issued in Tennessee and then converted by plaintiff while in Texas, and I believe converted means the same as renewed in this context, uh, was not subject to Texas law because the policy conversion was addressed in the original policy and left at the sole option of the insured, which is the same as the context for guaranteed renewable. I have another case uh, is Williams versus Mutual of Omaha, and that is a Fourth Circuit case, 298 Fed 2nd, uh, 876, and it rejects the argument that a Florida-issued policy in that case became a South Carolina-issued policy upon the payment of renewal premiums in South Carolina. Uh, the court held that this argument is self-defeating because it presupposes a mutual freedom of contract um, or to refuse to contract on each renewal term, which, this, you know, which we don't have here. Um, if there is a continuing promise by the insurer to extend coverage in successive renewal terms at the option of the insured, the promise was made in Florida where the contract was originally delivered, which is the same set of facts that we have here. Um, this set, uh, the way that insurance is regulated is something that's very complex because we have in the United States a national network of state-by-state -state insurance regulation. And we live in a migratory society, as Serrano B. Brooks says, where people are moving all over the place. And um, what the National Association of Insurance Commissioners is, is a national organization comprised of the chief insurance regulators of every state. And uh, they get together and they promulgate model acts, which are um, authoritative and cited in our brief. Um, and the, and it's not particularly relevant here, but the, the Long-Term Care Insurance Act in Connecticut and the Long-Term Care Insurance Act in Florida are both based on this model Long-Term Care Insurance Act. What is relevant is that they both define what a policy is for purpose of the act the exact same way. And they define it as um, a policy contract, subscriber agreement, endorsement, delivered or issued for deliver in, delivery in this state. In Florida, this state is Florida. In Connecticut, this state is Connecticut. This is a conscious decision by the legislature of Florida and the legislature of Connecticut and the respective insurance commissioners that the, that the primary jurisdiction and regulatory oversight of a policy from the time it is issued through the life of the policy is by the issuing state's insurance regulators. So um, this provides um, administrative convenience. This allows there not to, this respect of comedy and, and so that people aren't stepping on one another's toes. Florida says, if a policy is issued in Connecticut, it's not a policy under our act, and it's regulated by Connecticut. And Connecticut says the same thing. So to the extent that they're arguing that there's some public policy reason why we have to uh, um, apply Florida law to this, that's just not correct. The public policy in all of the cases that they cite is, that, uh, first of all, deals with coverage issues, which, again, we don't have here. And second, that public policy, uh, for example, in Guillen, is announced in specific state statutes. It says you know, Florida statutes say that this other insured provision is not okay in Florida. So the public policy uh, pronouncement is in the statute. Well, here the public policy pronouncement in the statute is that Connecticut regulates Connecticut-issued insurance policies and that Florida regulates Florida-issued insurance policies. And it, it, uh, it's the way that the legislatures have decided to divide up regulatory jurisdiction. And it's not for plaintiffs to decide or the appellants to decide that they've got a better system because the legislatures have decided that this is the system that they're going to use. That's not to say that Florida could not, should it choose, assert in a statute more extensive jurisdiction. Um, it's not a matter of that. Um, we, uh, we have and we cite some statutes in our brief where both Florida and Connecticut have stepped up and said under a special set of circumstances, we want to exert the full extent of our um, regulatory authority. For example, um, Connecticut General Statute 38A-508 says individual health insurance policies delivered, issued for delivery, amended, renewed, or continued in force in this state shall provide coverage for a child legally placed for adoption with the insured. This is saying, I don't care where this policy was, ent was entered into, and, 
if you're renewing it here or you're continuing it, of course, in Connecticut, and you've got an adopted child, that insurance company has to cover that child. That's a very specific example and very uncommon where the court is saying, or the uh, legislature rather is saying, to the full extent of our authority, we are going to assert jurisdiction over this policy. Uh, and it's not the language that we have here, which is Connecticut saying, we're only covering policies that were issued for delivery and delivery. Now, issued for delivery and delivery is a, uh, a term of art that refers to, I mean, it's not a term of art. It's specifically laid out in the statute. It's an event that occurs once. The policy is only issued by the company to deliver to the insured once. And it's only uh, issued once, and it's only delivered once. Um, and it's a distinct and different term or phrase than renewed. Because um, renewal, you can see in the provisions where renewal is used, that it means something different than issued for delivery and delivery and delivered. And we point out in our brief that uh, if delivery and issuance was something that occurred over and over and over again, it would render a number of provisions within this policy um, meaningless. For example, there's a provision in the policy that provides for um, incontestability, and it says that uh, the policy is incontestable two years after it's issued. Well, if it's issued every year, like the uh, appellant asserts, then what happens is uh, the policy would never be incontestable. Um, Another place is on page one of the policy, there's a 30-day free look period that says when the insured receives delivery of the policy, they have 30 days to look the policy over and make sure that they're okay with the terms and they want to be covered into it. And if they return the policy to the insurer within those 30 days, um, they can get a full refund. Um, if the policy was delivered every year like they're asserting it should be, then they would have this free look period every, you know, every year, and that's not uh, what the policy contemplates. It's a one-time thing. Uh, and there are a number of other examples that we point out in our brief that uh, I could go through if the court wants. Uh, well, you, I, I know you're arguing the court got it right on the deck action, but did the court get it right on the uh, statute of limitations as to the incontestability clause? Um, that is not an issue that we're raising uh, as, as grounds for affirmance before this court. Um, the order from the judge gave multiple independent grounds for dismissal. Uh, the plain language of the statutes, the plain language of the contracts, interpreting the, um, the language in the complaint. Um, I, it's my understanding that that incontestability provision, the only way I've ever seen it used is something that bars the um, insurer from, but. Um, but it appears that in the final judgment, the court applied a two-year statute of limitations based uh, on the incontestability provision. The, the judge cited three or four independent grounds for dismissal, and then at the end said, in any event, it, you know, it is or it may be, uh, you know, subject to this two-year limitations period. Um, Ju Judge Moreland is a, is a, a brilliant jurist and um, was very well prepared, and um, I looked for, you know, uh, so that was a gratuitous finding that she made. That was not one that was a Absolutely. Dance. Okay. Uh, it's our position you can look just to the language of the statutes. You don't even need to do contract interpretation or anything. Um, the law that applies to this policy, both under both Florida law and Connecticut law, points you to Connecticut Insurance Department. Unum wants to know who do I go to to get a rate change approval on this policy. They look to Florida law and it says this isn't a policy issued and delivered in Florida. So if you took this to the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation, they would say, this isn't our policy. You have to take it to Connecticut. And if you look at the Connecticut statute, it says this policy was issued for delivery and delivered to Connecticut. The Connecticut Insurance Department has regulatory jurisdiction over this policy. And, and so Florida law and Connecticut law are in agreement on this. So the court, at, you, at this point, you, you need to wrap up, Mr. Okay. Um, so uh, in conclusion, the applicable insurance code provisions um, dictate that this is a Connecticut issued policy subject to Connecticut law and the regulatory oversight of the Connecticut Insurance Department. Well, let me the just ask this last question sure. because Mr. Mann seems to allege that these are illegal premium rate increases that violate Florida law. Florida, it's not so much that Florida denied a rate increase. Are you arguing that Florida says this is not a Florida policy, therefore we have no control? Because Mr. Mann is arguing that Florida denied this rate change. It, 
there yeah and and as a result unum goes to connecticut to get the rate change that that is that's not uh but you just works. argued that this that florida has made no. florida department of insurance has made the conclusion this isn't a florida policy no i said if they had gone to florida this is a connecticut issued policy form if okay. you look on page one of the policy it has a little ct in the corner I understand. Um, there is a, a similar insurance policy in Florida that was issued to Florida insureds that bears the same, um, some of the same numbers on the policy form. Well, but that's, why did Unum then go to the Florida Department of Insurance to increase the rate on this policy if it's indeed a Connecticut policy? It did not. It cannot. They've alleged that they did. So that's what I was trying to clarify. No, no, I, I apologize. They're alleging that Florida issued insurance policies issued by unum to florida insurers um that's a different block that's of policies issued to, right um and that this is a connecticut block um and as the policy says on page one you can't change the um you can't change the rate for the man's policy without changing it for everybody in their policy group um if they were right that when you moved into a different state you paid a renewal premium that that policy becomes a policy issued and delivered in that state then there is a whole myriad of laws that would have to be complied with. This policy, not even their argument that the premiums might be illegal, the policy as a whole would have to be reviewed and approved by the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation for compliance with Florida law. It would have to bear a legend on page one under the Florida regulations that says this is a Florida long-term care insurance policy uh, approved in compliance with Florida law. And Connecticut doesn't have such a requirement because it's not a Florida-issued policy. So Unum never went to Florida no, no, no. on this, these No, policies. I'm saying if, if we accepted, if this court ordered, for example, that this was a Florida policy and Unum went to the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation, this court would be contradicting the legislature and telling, um, telling the Florida Office of Insurance Regulation that it would have to assert primary regulatory jurisdiction over a policy that does not meet the policy, the definition of policy within the insurance code. And uh, that's out of bounds, is, is my main point. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Warwick, we let uh, Mr. Kairala go over a little bit, so I'm going to give you your full five minutes for rebuttal. Appreciate it, Your Honor. Let me address that last issue first. Unum sells almost the identical, it may be the identical, but I. I wasn't allowed to have any discovery in this case, so I'm not sure. My research shows that they sell the identical policy in the state of Florida to Florida consumers in 1880, since 1984 and 85. But my question, sir, is hopefully you can answer is there's an allegation in your brief that Unum went to the state of Florida on this policy and others similar to it for a premium rate increase and Florida denied it. And then they went to Connecticut and obtained it. Is that your allegation? My, my allegation is that the same policy language, not for Mr. Mann, but for people with the same long-term care policy. So Unum's policy didn't change. The language of it, the clauses, all the provisions of it didn't change whether they sold it in Florida or whether they sold it in Texas or whether they sold it in Connecticut. So for the people they sold it to in Florida, they went to the Florida legislature and said, we would like to for increase Florida our premiums. Florida policies, not for this Florida, policy. Correct. And Florida said no. And Florida said no. Connecticut said yes. Okay. And so the difference that we allege is that this. So let's say their argument is there was a meeting of their minds back in 2098, or 1998, and that the meeting of the minds included everything except the premium, and that they're bound by it. Now, UNIP can change the most essential term in the contract. In fact, my client started off paying elderly couple retired on a fixed income, almost $6,000 a year for this premium. Their current premium under the Connecticut rates, even though they have no longer contacts with Connecticut whatsoever, is nearly $9,000 a year to keep this insurance in effect. Now, the insurance rates in most insurance reg industries are not regulated by the state. The Department of Insurance doesn't pro tell Progressive and State Farm what rate they can charge for car insurance because the state doesn't have a material interest. But here, the Long-Term Care Act was passed because the state of Florida does have an interest in the long-term care of the people and the citizens of the state of Florida. And that's what's really at issue here. They knew people were migratory. That's why they put a provision in there that says, we're going to conform our, provision, our, our contract to the provisions of the state where you live at the time of the contract. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew we would have the right to change our our premiums 
to accommodate for whatever may change in the future. So if you know the state of Florida where you live then at the time changes and makes it required that you have to pay for nursing home care doing X, Y, or Z, like the Long-Term Care Act does, then they said, fine, we'll conform to that where you live at that time because there's provisions including the coverage that would apply. And that makes sense because that's where the coverage is going to be given here in Florida. Under their theory, you could live one year in Connecticut and retire to Florida and live here for 35 more years until you need long-term care. And you're bound by the law of Connecticut? Well, the state of Florida has the case. And the Gillen case, which is cited in my opinion, was a, it's a, it's a car case. <laughs> and, and I wish it wasn't. I wish I had more case law on guaranteed renewable policies. The one case that I have is Bellcare, and they found that just because it was guaranteed renewable does not mean it didn't constitute a new contract every time it was renewed. But in the Gillen case, they were a New Hampshire resident that moved to Florida, and then they renewed their New Hampshire um, auto policy. And thereafter, they got in an accident, and they denied coverage based on being Florida residents. And they, they argued, well, New Hampshire allows this other coverage issue. So there was a statute in Florida that said, you can't re dictate that if you have other coverage from another insured and you're in an auto accident, then your current policy won't cover you. Because there was a statute that says that's, a, that's wrong and we don't want to do that for a matter of public policy in the state of Florida. But New Hampshire didn't allow that. They took a different approach and said, ah, it's freedom of contract up here in New Hampshire. And if, if you, that's what the contract says, that's what, the, that's what you're stuck with. And so the insurance company in the Gillen case argued, look, New Hampshire law should apply. Here's what the state of Florida said, no. Florida has a significant relationship to the insurance contract at issue for the following reasons. The covered vehicles were garaged in Florida at the time of the accident. The Gillens had taken affirmative steps to establish residency in Florida, and the risk of the policy was centered in Florida, and only minimal contact with New Hampshire remained. And so here, where you have a <laughs> health insurance is super regulated, Obamacare is super regulated, but the state of Florida has stepped up and said, we're going to take care of our seniors a special way. And they said, you can't charge the premiums, increase the premiums on our Florida folks. We have Florida citizens here. We've got a whole class of them. And instead of paying $6,000, which the other Florida residents are paying for these premiums a year, they're paying $9,000. And but if you have a fixed income, it's How does that statute critical. conflict with Connecticut law? It doesn't conflict with Connecticut law. It doesn't conflict with this policy at all. It's a Connecticut policy. Whoever is in charge of the rate in Connecticut is the Department of Insurance there, where they went through to achieve this rate increase. That Florida Department of Insurance controls the rates for Florida policies. What Once was you renew it in Florida under the, the law that site. I mean there's twenty five the cases case. including the case here. Only the Bell Care case where there's a Florida case. But you asked and him, I thought Dillon is an auto policy which is it's it's Elementary, the auto policy is a renewed contract every year. This is a long-term health care contract. Why can't Connecticut set their rates for their policies, as does Florida? Because once you transfer and become a Florida resident and you renew that policy, the Florida legislature has passed a long-term care. It says we get to dictate your your, your premiums, because we have an interest. We're going to pay out this health care. The long-term care statute in Florida doesn't say anything about premiums. Well, yes, it does. It says about coverage. No, there's a premium statute. It says yeah. about premiums for Florida policies. It doesn't say premiums for out-of-state policies. Well, that, right, that, that's, the, that's the whole crux. I believe the provision in there that says we will conform to the statute where you reside at the time of the conflict well, how do, you address how do you address counsel's argument that if that were the case and it affected, it, it, the renewal affects a new policy, well, it's going to change other, materially change other provisions of the contract. How do you address that argument? They put the provision in the contract. They knew people were migratory. They knew this was a long-term policy. And Everybody, because they knew that, they said Connecticut will always apply. It doesn't say. They keep referencing and make, making statements like it says that. It just says it's a, you know, it says that it was issued in Connecticut. There's no provision in here that says Connecticut will forever apply. They can't cite the one provision in there that actually says Connecticut or the Department of Connecticut uh, Insurance Regulation will govern premiums. It doesn't say that anywhere. It says we have the right to change the premiums. Now, other 
statutes dictate how they can change those premiums, but they're not referenced in the contract. Just like in Bellcare, it simply says we reserve the right to change the premiums. And because they reserve that right to themselves, it's a new pre new contract every time. I think what that's what, the difference. I think what makes your argument unworkable and reflects the instability was the hypothetical that the court posed to you that let's say that Florida raised rates. Then Unum that issued a Connecticut policy comes to Florida and says, raise our rates, Florida, Florida applies, let's raise the rates. I think your argument would be the reverse. This is a Connecticut policy coming into Florida to raise rates. But the provision that says where you reside at the time we conflict with that statute protects them. They drafted it. It must be viewed against the drafter. It's an insurance policy. So under Florida law, you must interpret the contract in favor of the insured and against the insurance company in, draft, in, in interpreting these contracts. And here, because they said, look, if there's a conflict with a statute, which there's a statute on premiums, where? Where you reside, when? At the time of the conflict. Well, then we'll conform it. They knew this was going to happen. They knew people were going to move. And that's why, if they didn't want it to do this, they would have said, if, it, if there's a conflict between the place where the policy was delivered or where it was originally issued, OK. But their contract language says, if there's a conflict of the statute between this policy and the statute of the state where you live at the time of the conflict, then we'll conform it. And premiums are governed under this section. That language is in there exactly for this reason. They know people are going to move. So they want to say, where you live is the critical factor at issue. Well, let me ask you this, then. If that's the case, why would UNUM, why would there need to be a Florida UNUM? Because you just said UNUM is here writing Florida policies. If that's the case, why would there have to be a Florida UNUM? Because if I'm up in Connecticut and it, wherever you live applies, why would they have to have a Florida UNUM? Well, because the statute, the regulations, the state, the long-term care act says if you sell long-term care here, we govern the rates that you can charge to our citizens. So, so our insurance want their cake and they want to eat it too. They could have gotten a UNUM Florida policy and be governed by unquestionably Florida rates for the many, many years they were here, but they chose not to. And they, they kept their Connecticut. Qualified. And so because they age, what happens is once you reach, you know, you pass the age of the mid 60s, you can no longer afford to buy this insurance. So you have to buy it early. And it's early. Remember, 1998, they were asking these people to pay $6,000 a year, this couple, for insurance. All right, I don't, I don't want to cut anybody off, but uh, I've let you go way over. So you need to wrap up, uh, Mr. Warwick. <laughs> That's a very difficult issue. I appreciate the first time. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, sir. You